I'm Wes O'Donnell. Welcome to National Harbor. I'm here with Bryson Bort, founder and CEO of Scythe and founder of Grimm Cybersecurity, also an Army veteran and West Point graduate. Bryson, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for having me, Wes. All right. So can you start by telling me a little bit about your military background? Uh, sure. So I was a Signal Corps officer, uh, which pretty much meant I ran around sandy grid squares where I didn't know where I was and <laughs> made sure I didn't get yelled at because everybody else could communicate. I don't think that a lot of active duty service members are well prepared for their transition. Uh, how was that transition for you? Was it difficult? Uh, absolutely. Uh, so to start, uh, I was injured. Um, so I was MEB'd in 2004 when we were redeploying to Iraq. And uh, so it was emotionally very difficult. Um, not only was I struggling with an injury that uh, was painful and um, very restrictive, um, I was now also facing a whole new world. Um, I went to West Point because I wanted to go out of a sense of patriotism. I wanted to give something back. And to suddenly now be facing a future that doesn't involve that was very disorienting. And I didn't know where to start. Um, so I went to uh, one of the JMO uh, recruiting companies where they cattle call you through to a bunch of companies and you don't know who you're going to meet until you walk in the door. Right. And um, I took the first job I was offered, which in hindsight said a lot about them more than it did about me. Right. Because I told them in the job interview, I didn't even know what the job title meant. And I wasn't joking and I wasn't being humble. I really had no clue what they were asking me to do. <laughs> and they hired me. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So what led you to cybersecurity initially? Um, I started as a kid mm -hmm. and I pretty much got through high school because uh, we had those graphing calculators. Mm -hmm. And it didn't matter what subject I was in, I was on my graphing calculator creating games. So like, I created Street Fighter on a graphing calculator. <laughs> and you would fight the computer, and I sold those games to my friends. And it kept me entertained, because I could be in English class programming on my calculator. <laughs> and the English teacher would generally frown upon that. But for the most part, I was allowed to pursue it. And uh, then I went and studied computer science at West Point. Mm -hmm. um, ironically, the first job I got out of the Army had absolutely nothing to do with IT because I really kind of felt like I needed a sabbatical from doing that. Right. Um, but within a year, I got back into it again. Oh, excellent. So that was a different generation when you were in school. And I think today, uh, one of the keys for cybersecurity is really getting the youth interested at a young age. Um, I just visited Pickney, which is a high school uh, in Michigan that has a cybersecurity range in it and tries to grab these kids when they're still in high school and, and get them interested into cybersecurity. Um, so switching gears, uh, talking about your business and your entrepreneurship journey, uh, where do you find good individuals to bring into your organization who have that cybersecurity background? Yeah, so um, before I started my company, I was a vice president. I was a corporate vice president at a defense contractor, and I ran the capabilities division. So we had several hundred folks. We grew it to several hundred folks. Um, and I've seen thousands of resumes. We've hired probably in the last decade, I've been in charge of hiring 500 to 600 people. And what's interesting is we always, as a group, ask that question of how do we find folks that will work right. because if we can refine the interview process, then we will have a greater chance of bringing in better talent earlier as opposed to the failure where somebody doesn't get it. And we, we found a few characteristics that worked, but we tried all sorts of different technical tests. We tried right. multiple interviews with different parts of the team. And at the end of the day, it really was a 50-50 thing. Um, we would bring in folks that were very technically competent, but because what cybersecurity requires you to do is not the engineering perspective of, I need to be the best at this part of the stack, but I need to be able to think holistically of risk, and I need to always be considering that at all time. It's a very different mindset, and it's really hard to gauge somebody's mindset. Right. And so even after about a year, we would find about a 50% rate of those who got it. Hmm. And the biggest trait that really seemed to make the difference was that passion and curiosity that they had right. of really trying, right? There's what you do during your day job, and then there was what they would go and seek an extracurricular to master and to learn and to engage and to understand and build a network of relationships that would help them 
be better at their job. And right. that was that was the biggest thing that I saw that was a, a difference. It's that, it's that passion. You're looking for that passion that they're. It's it's not just a job. Yep. For them. Yeah. So I recently visited uh, your Grimm cybersecurity facility in Michigan, and I saw this uh, Internet of Things model. And this model is used for uh, almost like a challenge to try and get people to, to hack into mm -hmm. different IoT devices inside this house. So can you tell me about the toaster? <laughs> 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 Has the toaster insulted you? Are you are you still <laughs> upset, Wes, about that? Yeah, I'm a little upset about the toaster. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, what we have in Michigan is our what we call our embedded systems or critical infrastructure lab. It's a 7,000 square foot facility that you can drive in vehicles. You can um, work on all sorts of these computers that aren't the kind of computers that are on your desktop, but are the kinds of the computers that pervade our everyday life. Right. And so right. a few years ago, we created. Um, a, a lab called Howdy Neighbor, which is the house you're talking about. Right. Uh, there's been a million dollars of research and development into that house. The, hmm. the construction doesn't look like it, but all of the engineering that went on the back end is the, sure. the complexity. So it has 25 different devices. Um, and what we did is we crafted what are called challenges around those devices. Hmm. So folks that at different conferences um, were working to put it online. So it would be the kind of thing that you could um, work with from home. Um, from your own home, not right. our home. Right. <laughs> and um, what those challenges allow you to do is start to get understanding different principles around reverse engineering, exploitation, open systems intelligence um, on this working house. Um, that uh, exhibit was uh, um, at the nonprofit I co-founded, uh, the ICS Village, where we do critical infrastructure education and awareness. Um, the, the biggest sort of security conference in the, in the world uh, for individuals is called DEF CON every right. year in, in Las Vegas. And uh, the Howdy Neighbor exhibit was at DEF CON last year. And that Capture the Flag competition as a part of the village actually earned um, the winner a black badge at DEF CON, which is a, like the highest mark of yeah. honor that you can get in the hacking community because you now have guaranteed free access to DEF CON for life. So a lot of other veteran entrepreneurs that I've spoken with, uh, they tap into their military network to try and score some of those early customers. Um, so for you in your startup journey, where did those early customers come from? <laughs> so day one of Grimm, I was there on my couch by myself, looking at the phone and going, OK, now I'm on my own. <laughs> now what? Right. Uh, and honestly, I, I went back to the, the network of relationships that I built up because the myth of the entrepreneur is this superhuman who does all of these things, and it's their passion and drive that make it all happen. Right. And that's certainly a factor. But more importantly, it's the relationships, it's the network that they have. Right and using that network and asking that network for help because your friends will help you. And that's what I did for two years. We scrambled from odd job to odd job. I was basically a cyber janitor. If you needed it, we did it. No job was too small. Right. No work was too beneath us. We did everything until we finally started to get that momentum as a small business um, where you start to get the, the bigger work, the bigger contracts. Uh, we broke into the commercial space out of typical government contracting, and that's where things really took off for us. That's interesting. So just asking, are you, are you a service-disabled veteran-owned small business? Yes, or is it, or? Grim is. Excellent. So then let's talk about funding, because I know that funding is a barrier for a lot of transitioning service members. You know, Some that may have a brilliant idea, uh, don't always have a perfect credit score, and, and, or have the ability to get a bank loan, mm -hmm. or they don't have the network for angel investors. Um, so what would you suggest to that aspiring veteran entrepreneur? I have two for-profit companies, Grimm mm -hmm. and Scythe, and each had a different funding model. Grimm, consultant-based businesses grow organically. You make money for the work you do, you eventually make enough money that you hire somebody, right. and then you hire somebody, and it just slowly grows that way. So Grimm, I was able to start by myself um, with a little bit of money, and we grew into our revenue, and that's how the company eventually blossomed. Um, the idea for the product Scythe that we created, um, originally we incubated that ourselves, and we paid for the research and development out of the money we were making at Grimm. But the biggest thing I realized at that point was it wasn't a question of money. It was a question of, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Right. I didn't know commercial products. I didn't know enterprise sales and marketing. These were all foreign concepts to me. 
What I needed was help. And I went out and looked to raise money from investors who had been there and had done it themselves so that I wouldn't make the mistakes that I would probably make on my own um, because I would have that counsel and guidance from somebody who has the skin in the game with me. Right. Um, now, that being said, that all sounds really easy. That was uh, a very painful 10 months of trying to raise for my seed round with Scythe. Um, considering I was technically already a, a successful entrepreneur, mm -hmm. the fact that I was East Coast, the fact that the company that I had built was a consultancy were seen as strikes against me to the VC community. Um, going and trying to raise money is like a decade of dating in a relationship mm. and there's no sex. You never get anywhere. Right. You just get rejected over and over and over until right. finally somebody comes and goes, all right, you're good looking. Let's, right. let's see where this goes. And that's the first time you get to be the, you get to be the prettiest girl in the room for a brief moment. Right. So you close your round and then they're like, all right, go to work. Right, right. I love that analogy. Yeah, so you know, this, it's not about me personally, but when I first left the Air Force, I worked for corporate America for a while. I went and started a very, very small business using my own savings. Um, I think I had $60,000 in savings at the time. Uh, designed and, and got a patent pending on a modular medical cart. And uh, it was during that first 12 months where I had this look in the mirror moment, like, what have I done? I haven't sold anything. <laughs> I've just taken my family from a very comfortable six figure job to the poverty line where we're on WIC and food stamps. Yep. And so there's that moment in an entrepreneur where, you know, in the, in the, especially in those early days in that valley of death where you're like, man, did I make the right decision? You know. Um, yeah, the, the honeymoon, that initial surge of enthusiasm when you start right. uh, quickly fades into the grind of reality, right. which is one, as the entrepreneur, everything rests on you, right? The paycheck, right. insurance, benefits, things happening or not happening. There is no, there's nobody to look back and go, oh, oh no, wait, you're it. Right. You're, the, you're the last stop. And the metaphor I always thought is, it's like being a cheetah on the, in the Serengeti mm -hmm. and you're in that dry season and your ribs are poking through and you're hungry and you're thirsty and you do whatever you can do to yeah. make it to when it's going to rain because it will rain if yeah. you can survive to it. And that's when you get to fill your belly and drink as much as you want right. and prosper until the next dry season because these things continue to feast and famine. Right. But that is, that is that gut check as an entrepreneur as you push through that. You wake up each day going, all right, I can get through this and I'm going to do this. And right. so the, the biggest advice I always give to a budding entrepreneur, because I think entrepreneurs are, we're a very exclusive society that's willing to accept anybody. Right. Once you're in, right. everybody will help you. Yeah. Whatever idea you have to go do, you have to want to do it so badly that when you wake up on those mornings where you're starving and you're thirsty, you're still going to attack the day and you're not going to give up. So jumping back to cybersecurity, uh, more and more companies are looking at um, vulnerability assessments. Uh, I, think, I think after last year, we had these pretty massive breaches. We had Facebook, T-Mobile. I mean, th there were some big names out there. Uber. Uh, I think companies are finally waking up to, you know, we're in the midst of a severe manpower shortage, a, s a severe shortage of cybersecurity professionals. Uh, what could companies be doing to better protect themselves? So there's a, there's a lot of focus right now in cybersecurity on automation, security orchestration and automation, automation at all these different levels because we don't have the talent. There are not enough people to turn the cyber wrenches every day in the trenches to make this all work. Um, the part that I would not blame on corporate America is I think we as a technical field have failed them. And what I mean by that, and I saw you see this in the military as well, the purpose of the military is that infantryman or infantrywoman now mm -hmm. going with speed and violence. That's what we do. Right. And the technical field is there to support and enable that. And it's the same thing in corporate America with business. The business was started and created for a reason, right? That right. business is there to make the world's best cookies. This computer stuff is just there to help them make the world's best cookies. And so the technical field, when they were talking to them and saying, well, cybersecurity is something we need to assure you that you can do this with these cookies. Right. The problem is that they did it in nerd speak. 
right? Nerds talking to other nerds. They didn't understand the business and they didn't talk to the business. So how's the business supposed to understand this person who's standing in front of you babbling in gibberish about CVSS vulnerabilities and why you should care? Right. Like, didn't I already give you enough money? Why, why isn't this problem solved? I don't understand. The cookies are still good. They're still going out. I don't, I don't get it. Yeah. Um, and it's hard to understand that not only is this the former realm of what we thought of as the 400 pound hacker eating pizza in his mom's basement to this is now a nation state activity. Mm -hmm. We have adversarial countries causing all sorts of damage and entropy and intelligence operations continually right. in places that we wouldn't necessarily think as direct targets. The hack of Marriott was most likely done because somebody was collecting intelligence on US officials. So when back to your question of what can corporate America do, um, I think they need to start to frame everything into the risk to the business. It's not just this technical risk. Right. Everything you do for that IT side needs to be prioritized and funneled back to how does it work to the business priorities and then funnel from there. So where is Scythe in five years? Where I hope Scythe is in five years, so first what we've built mm. is um, a tool that allows executives, so the executive perspective of you're spending this money on security. Right. You're spending it on technology, which everybody immediately thinks of, but more importantly, you're also spending it on people. Are your employees trained? Do they support or degrade the controls around your business? Your IT staff, are they able to function at the speed that you need them to? The folks that you contract to provide that support, are they providing you that support that you want? I mean, are you getting your money's worth? So that's what our, our tool does. Um, and how we did that is um, very much the military perspective of your risk is defined by your threat. And so what we allow you to do is dial up that threat hmm. on your production environment across the enterprise. And so if I get to be bold here, what I would hope is in five years, I've completely tipped the apple cart of how we look at this whole cybersecurity space right. and all of these vendors and all of these sectors, we've brought a measuring stick to the table for the first time where a company can evaluate for themselves because business risk is contextual and it's your risk. Right. You don't care about my risk, you care about your risk. Right. And now you can look at all of those products and all those services with that measuring stick that fits you and decide what works for you. That's, that's my, my hope, my right. claim, right. What, I, what I want to do in five years. No, I mean, that, that, that's actually surprising to me that companies don't already provide that and that uh, it's almost like a one-size-fits-all cybersecurity solution for a lot of firms offering their services. Um, I mean, it, it seems simultaneously brilliant but also obvious that you should be tailoring uh, or allowing the companies to tailor their own solutions based on their needs, based on the problems that they're having. Well, uh, Wes, this is why I was an army officer, because simple and obvious is about the best I can do. <laughs> right, right. So last question, what book are you reading right now? So I just finished reading uh, The Cuckoo's Nest. Hmm. Um, very funny book that gives you an insight to kind of the beginning of computer security from this sysadmin, um, this basically, as he describes himself, a hippie at Berkeley who right. suddenly found himself, in the, found himself in the middle of a, uh, one of the first major hacks across like, all of our military and intelligence infrastructure in the early 80s. Right. And it's very, very interesting and easy to read. Um, the book that I'm reading right now on my um, nightstand is uh, written by a friend of mine, Chris Kubeka, and it's called Hacking the World with OSINT. Hmm. So OSINT is Open Systems Intelligence, and it's the ability to gain data on anything you want because it's publicly available, and then using that to be able to conduct operations. Right, excellent. Well, Bryson, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, this has been Wes O'Donnell at National Harbor with Bryson Bort, founder and CEO of Scythe and Grimm Cybersecurity. <laughs>